China and the U.S. have reached a trade agreement, scrapping months of tit-for-tat tariff threats and calming the nerves of global markets. But are we truly out of the weeds, or are murkier waters still ahead? And Taiwan leader Tsai Ing-wen marked two years in office on Sunday. What policies will she push in her next two years, given strong public dissatisfaction over the economy and frosty ties across the Taiwan Straits? Welcome to The Point, live from Beijing, I'm Li Xin. After months of escalating tensions, the looming China-U.S. trade war has been put on hold. According to a joint statement released on Saturday, after two days of negotiations between teams led by Chinese Vice Premier Liu He and U.S. Treasury Secretary Steven Mnuchin last Thursday and Friday, the two sides agreed to stop slapping tariffs on each other. They also decided to develop a sustainable framework for addressing further trade concerns. So what pieces of uh, this complex puzzle are left to sort out. Is this just a temporary ceasefire between the world's top two economies? And how have changes in policies affected business leaders from abroad in China over the years? And what are their concerns looking ahead? Joining me in Beijing is Jack Pakalski, managing partner of JFP Holdings Limited, a Beijing-based merchant banking firm, also known as Mr. China. And in Hong Kong, Victor Gao, vice president of the Center for China. China and globalization. Gentlemen, welcome to the show. Before we uh, start our discussion, let's listen to the uh, spokesperson of China's Ministry of Foreign Affairs who had this to say on Monday. Just as Vice Premier Liu He said, the biggest outcome and consensus reached by both sides during this round of consultation was both sides realizing that the issues facing China-U.S. trade must be resolved through negotiations in order to avoid the mutual tariffs imposed against each other. As we said earlier, we wish the mutual beneficial factor can better serve its role in China-U.S. business and trade relations. So once again, gentlemen, welcome to the show. Um, Victor Gao, let me go to you first. How do you look at this agreement? Do you think it's a temporary truce agreement or have we found a peace mechanism? Well, first of all, I think the news coming out of Washington that China and the United States have reached agreement not to uh, slap each other with tariffs and to start real negotiation to solve the trade imbalance issue between China and the United States is really a good news. And it's good news for China, it's a good news for the United States, and it's good news for the rest of the world. Secondly, I think the more negotiations to come in the coming weeks will still be very tough. We are talking about China increasing imports from the United States. And in China, there is huge demand for many things produced in the United States especially, for example, technology goods. But the United States does not want to sell these goods to China. So that leaves the United States with not that much to sell to China. And also, China has huge demand for energy, natural gas, as well as crude oil, etc. And hopefully the United States can get its acts together to find enough goods to sell to China so that China and the United States can achieve better balance in their bilateral trade, not to reduce their bilateral trade, but to further increase the bilateral trade. And I hope the China bilateral trade can go all the way up to about one trillion U.S. dollars from the current roughly about 600 billion U.S. dollars. And for the additional amount to be added in China-U.S. trade, the United States can really do its homework and come up with more goods to sell to China. Well, That's we're going to talk about that in just a moment. Yeah, let, let me ask Mr. Pokolsky's uh, view on this agreement here. Is this something to be happy about for the moment, or can we really, uh, you know, sigh out a sigh of relief and say we found the way to move forward in the long run? First of all, I, I never really thought that it would uh, degenerate into a trade war between the two countries, primarily because, you know, China and the United States make up about 40 percent of the global GDP. And it's inconceivable that the two largest countries in the world would engage in a trade war. And having been in China for many years, I know that the Chinese leadership is very pragmatic, very practical. They don't want a trade war. Uh, Mr. Trump, uh, despite the rhetoric and so forth, doesn't want a trade war. 
either. I looked at this as kind of a, a negotiating process. And you know, I've been in China 25 years. I've never met a Chinese who's afraid to negotiate. Uh, Mr. Trump wrote a book on negotiating. So you had to expect that basically this would be a negotiation. I think that's what you see playing out, that essentially everybody kind of put their cards on the table, made their demands and so forth. Right. Now they're kind of discussing and figuring out, okay, how do we make this work? However, uh, looking at the uh, simple words and general terms of this agreement, gentlemen, do you think they are enough to address the problems which seem to be so huge coming, leading up to this negotiation, um, Mr. Uh, Pekoski? Well, I think you have to look at what's behind the words. I mean, obviously the words and people critical because it didn't specify amounts and so forth, but you have to look at what's behind that. Basically, they would not be making these kind of announcements unless there was, there was a basic fundamental agreement on the direction they're going. It doesn't mean all the details are worked out. And I think what Victor pointed out is very positive, that the emphasis is shift you shifted from how do we restrict imports into a country to how do we grow the exports from one country to the other, which is an increase in trade. And I think that's very, very positive. Mm -hmm for both China and the United States. Right. Victor, uh, let me come to you here. I think it is quite interesting because basically uh, instead of uh, cutting this, the cake more equal among the people present, you know, you enlarge this cake so that everybody can get a bigger share. But that's exactly what China has been advocating all along to address this problem, Victor. Uh, you know, what has exactly. happened? Yeah, what has happened here? Exactly. I think from the very beginning, China is bullish about China-U.S. trade. China is very optimistic about the prospect of China-U.S. trade. And China does not really want to have a trade surplus in its favor. A more balanced the trade will be better for China, will be better for the United States. However, I think it's really very simple. The United States simply need to come up with enough goods to sell to China. It cannot just blame China for selling so many goods to the United States. Most of the sellers of the Chinese goods to the United States are actually American companies which have invested in manufacturing capacities in China. So you are talking about a very robust trade between China and the United States. And the American investors and government officials should have great confidence in a great potential in China. If we really play it fairly, China can really generate huge demand for American goods and products. And the Americans should be really very, very, okay. feel very optimistic right. about the great size and the potential of the Chinese market going forward in okay. particular. Yeah, well, President Trump was very, very optimistic, right? He wanted to uh, have this 200 billion U.S. dollar um, cut off the trade um, deficit that the United States is, is supposedly suffering from China. But, Mr. Pukowski, what is the realistic expectation of the kind of uh, increased export the U.S. can look at in the near term to China? Well, first of all, when people talk about that 200, million or 200 billion dollar number, they tend to look at the situation as it is today. However, the, you know, what I've heard basically is they're talking about a 2020 kind of time frame. And in the meantime, the Chinese economy will continue to grow. The Chinese imports, because as, as an economy grows and matures and becomes, uh, you know, you know, basically the need for imports from other countries tends to grow. So you had, for example, in 2017, a very large increase in China imports and so far this year the same pattern is holding true so I think it's a it's going to be a, a moving target as far as the potential demand and I think that when you look at it in that sense I think there's a lot of room for imports from the United States and you know agriculture energy the United mm -hmm. States makes a lot of technology products yes we have to work out some of the issues with uh, what we you know the government will let companies sell to China but those can all be worked out those are not insurmountable issues. Yeah, Dr. Uh, Gao, how do you look at the kind of expectations that should, that can be reasonable in the near term? I mean, 200 billion U.S. dollars, is it really possible if you think about, you know, a Boeing planes that the U.S. says to China or, uh, or the soybeans, they only come to tens of billions uh, on an annual basis. It's, it seems to me it's just impossible if you really want to put up this number there. No, I don't agree. I think the potential in the China market is huge, 
And if we really respect each other, China and the United States respect each other, treating each other as equals, and the United States no longer you know, uh, act very whimsically and uh, refuse to sell certain things, for example, refuse to export chips to ZTE, for example, and the United States can become more and more of a reliable exporter, then the demand in China will be huge. It will help Americans to create hundreds of thousands if not millions of new jobs in the United States. Uh, the other panelist uh, is correctly uh, pointing out, you know, energy, for example, high-tech, agricultural products, you name it. I think if we really uh, do a good homework in China, we can come up with a very long list of things that the Chinese consumers, corporates here in China want to buy. In China, there is goodwill towards the American people. We really like the quality of the American products, the reliability and the trustworthy of the American products. Pharmaceuticals, for example, drugs, medical care, many things, both in uh, trade, for example, as well as in the service industry. Okay. So, the Americans really should not lose confidence in the reliability and the sustainability of the huge market here However, in China. However, there are people who are not uh, very confident in the reliability of uh, uh, maybe this president. Uh, there are already people saying uh, or warning that uh, President Trump is going soft after having been very, very hard and that, uh, you know, on the case of the ZTE, after he, uh, you know, announced the intention to go soft on ZTE, the House of Representatives just uh, unanimous, unanimously voted to back away from that. So, Mr. P um, Pekoski, what kind of ost obstacles could be in the future for this agreement to really translate into real action? Well, I think that, uh, you know, the trade is just one piece of the puzzle. And I know that a lot of the people in the administration like to say that well, they're not related. But all these issues, the actions with respect to North Korea, the, uh, the trade issues, all those things are, you know, all related. They're all wrapped up in the Sino-American relationship. Mm -hmm. And I think that, uh, frankly, because of the personal relationship that's developed between President Xi and President Trump, I actually am quite optimistic that will come to a, you know, to a successful resolution of this. Mm -hmm. But Victor, how do you look at this kind of uh, fear that China will over overcome the United States and the fear that by going soft on the trade issue that China has out-negotiated the United States once again? Have these fears been overcome overnight? No, I don't think so. There are still people in the United States, especially in Washington, who have not come to terms with the prospect that China will continue to enjoy growth and eventually China will be a much larger economy than the United States. They actually want to derail that process, which is a mission impossible. The Chinese growth has its own momentum and it's irreversible. So I think these people in the United States can serve themselves better and serve the United States better if they become more realistic, become more pragmatic. They need to engage China. They do not want to ripe or write off China as the biggest market in the future. They need to really engage China, try to figure out what's the best way for the Americans to make more money out of China, rather than run the risk of but China. But by engaging with China, China might catch up American and surpass America. the United States, Victor. How, what would you say to that? Yes, that has happened. That is going to happen. I don't think Americans need to really go into uh, schizophrenic about China eventually becoming larger than the United States. China now is already larger than the United States in many respects. And for the foreseeable future, during our lifetime, China and the United States will become the two largest economies, one way or another. Sometimes China is ahead of the United States, other times the United States is ahead of China. It doesn't matter. The world is big enough and the Americans should have enough confidence that with China being larger than the United States, that's not the end of the United States of America. The United States can continue okay. to thrive and to prosper with China as its biggest trading partner, with right. China well, as a wanna... very important power on the world, in the right. world. If you're, biggest, you're, if you're the biggest manufacturer in the world, you want somebody to buy your products, right? So we have to leave it there. Many thanks to my two guests uh, in Beijing, Jack Pekulski, managing partner of JFP Holdings Limited, and in Hong Kong, Victor Gao, vice president of the Center for China and Globalization. And you have been watching The Point with me, Liu Xin. We'll take a quick break, and when I come back, we'll look at Taiwan leader Tsai Ing-wen's first two years in office. Are her policies actually working for the island? Thank you.
May 20th was the second anniversary of Taiwan leader Tsai Ing-wen taking office. Although she didn't give any public address, she chose to mark the occasion with a live-streamed interview in response to over 450 questions netizens had submitted over the past three weeks. Around 2,000 people watched the live broadcast, which was described by commentators as miserable. So how is Tsai Ing-wen doing after two years in office? Although Taiwan's economy is showing slight growth, analysts say these figures do not translate to regulate people who are struggling to make ends meet as salaries stagnate and the cost of living soars. Over the past two years, cross-trade relations have also soured as a result of Tsai Ing-wen's refusal to accept the so-called 1992 consensus, which recognizes there is only one China. So why have her economic reforms failed to deliver benefits so far? Will Tsai make any efforts to enhance cross-trade relations in her next two years before the real Election. I'm joined in Shanghai by Professor Wang Zheng Xu from the Department of Political Science at Fudan University and from Taipei, Joanna Lei, former Taiwan legislator. Welcome to both of you. Joanna, let me come to you first. It's been two years since Tsai Ing-wen became the leader of Taiwan. The uh, Taiwan Next Generation Foundation, Next Gen Foundation, and the Taiwanese Public Opinion Foundation, or TPOF, released their polls on the second anniversary of her inauguration, and the survey found found that 53.5% of respondents support her, while 44% of them were satisfied with her performance. What's the difference between these two numbers? Uh, what do the majority of Taiwan people think about her performance? Actually, there are about four public opinion polls being released um, a couple of days before her inauguration anniversary. And they range um, from 46% to 56% disapproval rate. And if you look at the numbers, they are supported by many of the undecided ones moving into disapproving her performance. And also her prior supporters decided to move into the disapproval rank. So it is very clear that in the past two years, Taiwan voters have voted in a very clear way that they disapprove what Tsai Ing-wen has done in the first two years. Her first two years are characterized by missed opportunities, wrong judgments, and bad executions in all her major policy initiatives. Hence, the numbers are well supported by the qualitative numbers saying that people are disapproving her cross-strait relations and disapproving on her handling of economic development. And the third one was disapproving her so-called judicial reform. So all three of her major initiatives didn't receive a passing grade. Well, Professor, one of the six uh, policy initiatives covered in the same poll economy was the worst aspect in Tsai Ing-wen's two years of office, followed by cross-strait relations, among others, with uh, um, some 30 percent of people very dissatisfied with her economic performance. What does she do wrong, or how did she get herself into this current situation? Well, I think, first of all, to be fair, the world economy for the past few years has not been very good and many economies around the world are suffering or having a difficult time uh, including some previously star performers such as India and for example Brazil so Taiwan is not ex an exception uh, but that said I, I do think uh, Thai, Thai D uh, should take responsibility for uh, very, very uh, serious economic stagnation and mostly because now she rejects the one China principle that put her uh, in the op opponent with the mainland, so mainland refused to give her any chance for economic cooperation. And also I think Tsai herself, uh, she is not a very good uh, economic manager. Uh, she is not interested in economic affairs. Uh, she is a very political uh, driven leader uh, and she is not, not managing a very effective team in Taiwan to uh, run the economy. Mm -hmm. Joanna, now Taiwan's economy grew actually 3% year on year for the first quarter of this year, but people seem to complain, or people are complaining that their wages do not go up, which was what she pledged during her campaign. What happened? How could the economy keep growing and yet salary remain stagnant? Yeah. <laughs> 
Well, actually, our, her party um, friction actually claimed that the economic performances of her first two years were fantastic. Economy was moving, growing in a higher rate, unemployment rate is low, and they also said the Taiwan Stock Exchange is having a huge run with uh, 12 consecutive years over 10,000 points. However, if you look at very carefully in the salary part, while the overall salary seems to be showing a mild increase, still over 3 million people receive less than 30,000 NT dollars a month, among which 400,000 receive less than 20,000, which is below poverty lines. Therefore, while Taiwan has a lot to congratulate herself in terms of the overall macro numbers, but if you look at individuals and individual families, there are a lot of people who are suffering, and in fact, they do not see any hope in terms of getting out of the below poverty line situation, specifically because our tourism and all those local consumption engines, the drivers, none of them are being fired up at this time. Well, in her live-streamed interview, Tsai Ing-wen said that the government would continue to uphold the policy of maintaining the status quo across the Taiwan Strait. But uh, over the past two years, cross-strait relations have been deteriorating as a result of a refusal to accept the 1992 consensus. Uh, the same poll revealed that up to 56% of the public are unsatisfied with the policy in that regard. So, Professor Wong, what will be the future trend of a policy in this respect, and uh, what will be the outcome expected? Well, oh, I think uh, by uh, very stubbornly refusing uh, to talk to China under the One China framework, uh, the 1992 consensus, uh, she is putting herself in, in a trap that she cannot get herself out of. And so mainly now already rejects, kind of write her off uh, in terms of negotiation, uh, cooperation. Uh, and then at the same time, the mainland will uh, exert uh, very l uh, big pressure internationally, uh, diplomatically. Uh, so in the last two years, you saw uh, two Taiwanese uh, 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 diplomatic relations were severed, uh, and that is going to continue, uh, and China's international space is uh, uh, going to be uh, squeezed further down, uh, then that will invite more uh, unhappiness from within Taiwan. So I don't see uh, a way out of this. Uh, for the long run, it just uh, gives her much more pressure in, in terms of her performance rating. Now, the number of tourists from Chinese mainland, as you mentioned, uh, both uh, dropped by one-fifth last year and have been dropping since Tsai came into power. In response, uh, Tsai seemed to have sought to shift Taiwan's export market from a heavy dependence on Chinese mainland and Hong Kong by pushing a so-called new southbound policy in a bid to develop uh, closer ties with the South and Southeast Asian countries. So, Joanna, why does she avoid the low-hanging fruit, and uh, is she likely to come back to realize, you know, probably it is really the right, right thing to pick for the moment, especially when the economy is stagnating? Well, unfortunately, we didn't see any sign of such reversal of her policy. Even though everybody could see that we lost 22% um, of mainland Chinese tourism, and that means we lost about 2. Point, um, uh, we still have about 2.73 million million Chinese tourists, but lost 40 billion NT dollars in economic possible gains. Uh, cur currently, all the southbound or south tourists are being subsidized by Taiwan government. So while we do see an increase in numbers of tourists from Southeast Asia, they do not contribute as heavily to the local consumption as mainland Chinese tourists. So it is very clear that if you use your economic might to calculate this, Tsai Ing-wen should revert in her current policy. However, unfortunately, her policies are being backed by very flawed ideology, and that ideology is probably bonding her to a wrong path, which allows less mainland Chinese tourism to come to Taiwan. As a result, Taiwan economy suffers. 
Um, Professor Wong, the PLA or the People's Liberation Army, the, the army of, uh, the, um, of China, uh, their air force conducted encirclement drills earlier this month around uh, Taiwan with its new uh, SU-35 fighter jets along with the bombers. Meanwhile, PLA expanded its air force base at uh, Fujian, which is uh, right across uh, Taiwan, at Fujian Shreiman Airport. So uh, what has led to the Chinese mainland mounting pressure? pressure on Taiwan in such a way? Well, I think the military build-up and military exercises are meant to first, uh, of course, deny the, any explicit move toward uh, independence, uh, and more importantly, to, to remove the possibility that the United States might uh, take uh, might intervene uh, in the case of uh, military action in Taiwan, or just to really to deny the U.S. the option of using uh, some radical moves to uh, use Taiwan against China. Uh, the uh, current president of the United States, uh, a few months ago, he, he was uh, playing out the Taiwan car, uh, signing a Taiwan travel act. Mm -hmm. I think the mainland act very. Uh, very nicely, very proactively by uh, staging a military exercise uh, right after the Boao Forum. So it was a preemptive uh, action that actually uh, stopped the U.S. from taking an option uh, using Taiwan against China. Okay, we have to leave it there. Many thanks to my two guests uh, in Shanghai, uh, Professor Wang Zheng Xu from the Department of Political Science at Fudan University and from Taipei, Joanna Lei, a former Taiwan legislator. And uh, to wrap up, here is my point, my personal commentary. So we had two topics today, the trade talks between China and the United States and the two-year mark of Tsai Ing-wen of the uh, Democratic uh, Progressive Party of Taiwan in office. Seemingly separate topics, but I do see something in common. And I see whenever a leader or an administration talk about his or her policies, the numbers quoted might tell a good story, but it's the concrete benefits that people get in their hands that really make the difference. President Trump could claim credit for keeping his campaign promises on trade with China, but if the average man on the street gets hurt by such policies, these promises will backfire. Luckily for now, he has realized the long-term interest rests with engagement and interaction with China instead of confrontation. For Tsai Ing-wen and her administration, it's a similar story. Whatever the numbers show about the island's GDP growth, it cannot conceal the fact that the people are not getting paid more. Investors are wary and students are seeking a future on the mainland. Confrontation might bring louder cheers from hardline supporters, but cooperation is the only way to expand your support base. That is it for this edition of The Point with me, Lu Xin. As always, follow me on Facebook and Twitter using the handle The Point with Alex. Download the application called CGTN to watch the show on your mobile devices or go to YouTube and look for CGTN The Point. Thanks for watching. You've got The Point.